Good afternoon. Uh, indeed, a pleasure to welcome my neighbor, Professor Brush from University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, actually, to re-welcome him, he has given a colloquium here before about 10 years ago. Uh, a graduate in physics, summa cum laude, from Harvard University. He was a Rhodes Scholar and received his PhD at Oxford, he returned to this country at uh, Livermore National Lab, and where he performed very early on in the late 50s, actually, a first computer calculation on uh, how a classical plasma would indeed uh, make a phase transition to an ordered uh, solid state, a result which is uh, even today being used in the stellar structures and planetary structures. Uh, but perhaps his first love was uh, making science available to common citizens and he had returned to Harvard to work with Holton on the subject and uh, actually published a book uh, uh, along with him and a third edition of which, which is to appear next March, which is called Attractive Title of uh, Human Adventure from Copernicus to Einstein and Beyond. Uh, a little over three decades ago, he came to the University of Maryland, uh, where he's currently a distinguished, distinguished university professor of history of science with the joint appointments in the Department of History and the Institute of Physical Science and Technology. Has uh, published copiously with attractive books like Kinetic Theory of History of Kinetic Theory of Back Gases, uh, Culture and Science in the 19th Century, Static, statistical Mechanics and Atomic Theory of Matter from Boyle and Newton to Landau and uh, Onsager. He's also published a three-volume book on modern uh, history, of history of modern planetary uh, physics. He's also co-edited a number of books and articles written on controversial subjects like uh, evolution and creationism and more uh, uh, sub subjects of uh, great interest, uh, to particularly to the to women, like women and women in science. He has his uh, research funded from uh, various agencies, NEH, NSF. He was also a Guggenheim Fellow. He spent some time at UCLA, Minnesota Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. He was a president of the History of Science uh, Association. He was also a co-founder of the History of Physics Division of the American Physical Society, of which he is a fellow, as he is also a fellow of the American Association of Advancement in Science, and he's also a corresponding uh, member of the Académie Internationale d'Histoire des Sciences. Uh, he, today he is uh, here to discuss with us what is his latest love, how exactly are physical theories accepted and rejected. He's studied a number of them, and today he's going to talk to us about why was relativity accepted? Professor Brush. <clears throat> I, I might need to have a cup of water if you uh, sure. have one available. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, please uh, move down closer if you are unable to read the transparency, which is projected now because there will be more uh, with uh, smaller uh, letters, some of them larger letters, and I want to be sure that uh, everybody can, can uh, read what is up there. Um, <clears throat> the first uh, question that I wanted to address has to do with the grammatical, grammatical structure of the title, which is in the passive voice. You might wonder uh, who is the subject, who it is that is going to be accepting or not accepting relativity, and so just to be clear about that, uh, I want to show you what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, this is a cartoon from the New Yorker several decades ago uh, <clears throat> in which the issue was addressed of whether the uh, man in the street, I suppose, or woman in the street uh, has been able to accept uh, Einstein's theory of, of uh, relativity uh, and is able to uh, you know, gradually accustom himself to uh, the ideas of space and time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, however, there are a number of historians who have uh, discussed that uh, type of issue. <clears throat> My primary concern is uh, the community of physicists uh, and astronomers and mathematicians. And 
My interest is simply uh, how do theories get accepted? What are the reasons that uh, people accept them or reject them? Uh, of course, one can never know the real reason uh, because uh, that is forever uh, hidden in the minds of these people. So I'm really talking about what people say when they publish articles or sometimes when they write letters. Uh, what can one infer from the available <coughs> historical evidence? And uh, as it happens, a number of historians have studied this question. Uh, and in fact, we have in my field of the history of science uh, a category of research known as reception studies, which means uh, the reception of a particular theory or discovery. Uh, and as it happens, uh, uh, a large number of these have been done uh, on uh, essentially three subjects. One of them is uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, which has been widely studied. One of them is Freud's uh, psychoanalysis, and one is relativity. Uh, so there are a number of studies on the theory of relativity and how it was received in various different countries. Um, one of the problems that I find with, with reception studies done by some people is that they simply tell you whether or not somebody accepted the theory, but they don't go into the question of why they uh, did so. And that's my reason, because I'm really interested in understanding the process by which new ideas and discoveries get from the frontier to the core of knowledge, how theories become knowledge, in other words, uh, and what are the reasons why these uh, theories get accepted or rejected. Uh, and I'm going to try to organize this material uh, in three categories. First of all, empirical reasons, specific uh, experimental facts and observations that can be uh, observed, explained, perhaps predicted in advance by the theory. Uh, the second one is social or psychological reasons why uh, people might accept a theory. And the third is what I'm calling the aesthetic or mathematical reason, which I think is especially important in the case of relativity and also is necessary uh, in order to avoid the problem which often comes up in my field where people think of only two possible reasons. Uh, they say, well, either something is accepted because of the facts, uh, the observations, the experiments, the empirical reasons, or it's accepted because of some kind of social influence or social construction, uh, as if those were the only two possibilities. And therefore, the, uh, you find a number of papers by people in, in uh, science studies who seem to think that if they have shown that the empirical reasons uh, are not adequate to justify accepting a theory, then what's left must be a social reason. And some of the arguments about social construction seem to be based on that kind of logic. So I think one has to have at least three possible types of reasons so that you avoid this inference that, that just because it's not one of them, therefore, it's the other. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about what some of these um, reasons might be, and then I'll go into them in more, a little more depth. Um, for example, uh, in Thomas Kuhn's theory of scientific revolutions, uh, he talks quite a bit about anomalies, the fact that uh, you have a paradigm which uh, governs your work, uh, but you find that there are some phenomena in the real world which cannot be explained by the paradigm, no matter how hard you try. And therefore, some kind of anomaly is going to, that is an anomaly being something, a fact that can't be explained by the theory, will force you to uh, look for another explanation. Uh, another view of how science works uh, is due to the philosopher Karl Popper, who died a few years ago. And he put tremendous emphasis on the idea that the way science works is to make a hypothesis, derive some predictions from the hypothesis, go out and test the uh, predictions, and be willing to give up or substantially modify your theory if the experiment refutes the prediction. Uh, if, it, if it confirms the prediction, then it doesn't mean the theory is true, but at least you can retain it as a, uh, a working hypothesis. So that's 
another view of how uh, science works, which again gives a, um, a, a fairly important role to empirical facts in the process of choosing theories. Now, Popper's idea was originally intended to convince the reader that there are certain types of theories that masqueraded as being scientific, such as Marxism and psychoanalysis, which uh, he was particularly opposed to, uh, simply because he felt they were so flexible they could explain anything. In other words, a Marxist uh, will never admit that he's wrong. He will always be able to find some explanation for whatever happens. Uh, and similarly, according to Popper, uh, a psychoanalyst, uh, such as uh, Freud or, or Jung or Adler, in fact, Popper worked for a while with Adler in Vienna, uh, will always be able to explain any kind of observation that you make about human behavior and able to explain it from the point of view of the theory. So that the theory can never be refuted because it doesn't go out on a limb and say, this must happen, and if it doesn't, the theory is wrong. Uh, Unfortunately, Popper went a little too far with this idea and uh, formulated the theory in such a way that Darwinian evolution uh, was considered not to be a legitimate theory. In fact, he called it a, a pseudoscience uh, because he thought you could not make uh, predictions in any practical way uh, of what was going to evolve in the future. Uh, and later he recognized that uh, this was a mistake. In fact, that the concept of prediction uh, as that he had started with uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you predict in advance something that has not already been observed, but rather that you predict in the sense of deduce uh, mathematically from a theory something which may be already known. Uh, so he actually retracted his uh, initial verdict and decided that Darwinism is in fact a legitimate scientific theory. So these questions are still being hotly argued by uh, philosophers. Uh, also, those of, if you have any knowledge of what Bayesian analysis is, uh, you may be aware that uh, Bayesian analysis in, st in statistical theory uh, puts an emphasis on finding new facts uh, as evidence for a theory that weren't already known when you formulated it. So that's one of the interesting issues that I have been concerned with as to whether scientists do in fact uh, give credit to the confirmation of predictions of things that were not pre previously known, what the philosophers call novel predictions as opposed to deductions. Uh, under the category of social or psychological explanations, the primary one is what has become known in the last two or three decades as the social construction of scientific knowledge, the idea that scientists will develop and choose a theory which is somehow in their interest to do so, interest being in treated in the social or political or ideological sense uh, that uh, they construct these theories uh, rather than simply discovering something which is objectively out there. And there has, of course, been a large amount of controversy about this idea. Uh, if you are familiar with the so-called science wars of the last few years, uh, it centers in part around this claim that scientific theories are socially constructed rather than being uh, based on objective uh, reality. Uh, and we have, uh, in fact, one of the advocates of social constructionism, David Bloor at Edinburgh, uh, has, t uh, in answer to a challenge, uh, to actually prove that there's any case in which any theory is really socially constructed, uh, has chosen the theory of relativity. And I'll come back. Uh, and, and talk about that later, but that was what one of the defenders chose as the one case that he could demonstrate was socially constructed. Uh, finally, there's an interesting book by Frank Soloway called Born to Rebel, which came out a few years ago, uh, which looks into a number of, you might say, psychological characteristics of scientists that make them disposed or not disposed to accept new ideas, uh, and he found uh, with extensive analysis that the person, say this, a second born son in a family is more likely to accept radical new ideas than the first born son. So this, and he has a psychological uh, account of this. Finally, um, aesthetic or mathematical reasons I think are particularly pertinent in the case of relativity, but uh, a philosopher, uh, James McAllister, 
uh, published a book a couple of years ago called Beauty and Revolution, in which he gave a fairly detailed analysis of how aesthetic considerations, what you consider to be a beautiful theory or a simple theory, uh, how that factor goes into the uh, way in which scientists decide to accept the theory or not. Uh, and since relativity is often said to be a, 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 a theory which has a special symmetry and beauty, uh, that I think is a possible explanation as to why somebody would accept it. Uh, now let's go a little more into detail about empirical factors, and I think to begin with I just want to remind you of a number of the empirical predictions and explanations that are associated with relativity. And what I have done here is list in chronological order the major empirical facts that are usually considered to be somehow involved in the history of relativity, either as phenomena that were explained by the theory or phenomena that were predicted in advance uh, by the theory. Uh, so it's a fairly long list. It uh, won't fit on one transparency. Here's, here's uh, uh, the rest of the list. And I have only carried this up to, uh, primarily up to about 1930, 1932, because most of the phenomena that were in some way involved in this process uh, were established by the mid-1930s, the exception being the gravitational redshift, which wasn't really clearly established until 1960. But I think by the mid-1930s, you could say that the process of acceptance of relativity was pretty much complete. Uh, there are still debates about the general theory of relativity, uh, which, had, which pretty much died down in the 1930s and, and were revived in the uh, post-war years. But the process that I'm talking about really has to do with the early uh, first three decades of the 20th century, which is when the uh, theory was being actively debated, and the whole issue was pretty much settled uh, by the mid-1930s. And the question then is, to what extent were these particular empirical facts persuasive to scientists, persuading them to accept uh, the theory? Uh, now, in analyzing the effect of empirical facts, uh, there are some questions that you can ask. Uh, for example, which of them were already known before Einstein uh, proposed his theory? Uh, and did he propose relativity in order to explain these? And this is an interesting historical question which has been uh, discussed quite a bit. Uh, did the facts that were predicted by the theory and later confirmed, that is, novel predictions, count more heavily than previously known facts which were explained by the theory. So in particular, uh, did the, something like the gravitational bending of light by the sun, which was a novel prediction, had not been observed before Einstein predicted it, uh, count more because it was a prediction of something not yet seen than, let's say, the advance of the perihelion of Mercury, which had been known for several decades but had not received a satisfactory explanation yet. So that's a question which I have found is of considerable interest to philosophers of science and practically no interest to scientists themselves. Uh, and uh, everybody always looks puzzled when I even bring up this question, who, who, why should anybody care? Uh, but anyway, it is relevant, I think, what were the facts that were known or became known before relativity was generally accepted uh, which, as I say, is, is by the 19, early 1930s, and thereby could have influenced its acceptance. Um, and then a, 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 a question that has to be asked about this particular case is, um, we talk, of course, as, as physicists about the special theory and the general theory, and does that mean we have to ask all these questions twice, or is there some interaction between them? Uh, in other words, if, if uh, you pr present uh, evidence which is sufficient to convince somebody to accept the special theory, does that mean they're also going to accept the general theory, or conversely? Uh, 
and uh, do, is it a package deal, in other words. Either you accept both theories together or you reject both of them, or you could perhaps accept the special theory and not the general. I'm not aware of anybody doing the opposite. I'm not aware of anybody accepting the general theory but not the special, although I suppose logically it would be uh, possible to do so. So anyway, that's a, 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 a slight complication which comes into this particular case. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk a little bit about this first case of, um, first example, first word that I use, anomalies. Um, Thomas Kuhn distinguishes between a puzzle and an anomaly. Uh, a puzzle is, is something which you're expected to be able to solve, and your failure to solve it doesn't reflect on the paradigm, but only on your own competence. An anomaly uh, is a problem that nobody can solve within that paradigm, and thereby uh, leads perhaps to a crisis and a change of paradigm. Now, I think that this is a case where Kuhn's theory should not be considered as a reliable uh, description of the history of real science. And in fact, this is the, uh, perhaps one of the weakest parts of his theory, uh, the problem that there really aren't any uh, serious anomalies that you can show uh, led to a revolution. Uh, however, in the case of the theory of relativity, uh, I think this is an example where in the past a lot of people have thought that the negative result of the Michelson-Morley experiment was in fact an anomaly that motivated Einstein to introduce the special theory and thus was in a sense a reason for him to develop and accept his own theory. So this is an, a question that has been debated by historians. Uh, Michelson-Morley experiment, as, as you know, uh, showed that uh, back in the, 19, in the 1880s that it's impossible since somehow to detect the motion of the Earth uh, through space by an experiment which you would expect to be able to, uh, to do so. Uh, so you can't observe somehow the absolute motion of the Earth uh, in space. Uh, and uh, my colleague Gerald Holton showed about 30 years ago by extensively analyzing the documents uh, that this was not a major motivation for Einstein. Of course, he doesn't even mention the Mar Michelson-Morley experiment uh, in his first paper in 1905, uh, but uh, there is a lot of confusion because when people would ask Einstein this question while he was alive, uh, if he was sitting at a banquet table with Michelson about to receive some prize, then Einstein would dutifully get up and say, yes, Michelson uh, was the basis, his famous experiment was the basis for my theory. But when Michelson was not around and somebody was interviewing Einstein, he would say, well, actually, I'd never even heard of the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1905. All he knew was the sort of, you know, the general review uh, books by uh, Lorentz and so forth, which sort of lumped all these things together. So uh, Holton concluded that, that um, it w really was not the reason why Einstein proposed the th special theory in the first place. However, uh, later, after the theory was proposed, uh, it turns out that it was a major reason for other scientists to accept the theory. So this is, uh, I think, uh, has been fairly well uh, shown. Uh, Okay, I will skip over the uh, other bits on that transparency. Um, so this is, anyway, this is the thing that I'm interested in is the novel predictions, and they often hear the statement, the hardest thing to predict is the, the future. Uh, the thing which is, is um, uh, interesting in, and causes a lot of confusion is scientists, and this is particularly true of physicists, use the word prediction in the general sense of deduction. So that when a scientist says, my theory predicts x, it does not mean x is going to happen only in the future or will become known only in the future. You also use the phrase, my theory predicts x, when you mean simply, I can deduce rigorously from my theory a fact which is already known. And it is because of the use of the word prediction that many people seem to have gotten the impression that prediction in the sense of predicting something not yet known is an important criterion for uh, judging a, uh, a theory. Uh, now, one of the reasons for doing this, which at least the philosophers tell us, is that um, 
if you're given a fact, a good theorist, theorist can always explain it. This is what exactly Popper was trying to avoid. Uh, and so you can say, uh, knowing the fact already, you can always fiddle around with your theory and uh, produce an explanation of it. Uh, on the other hand, you can say if something is evidence for a theory, it's evidence for a theory in a logical sense can't really depend on when you knew it. So the idea that knowing the evidence before you made the prediction somehow counts more than only knowing it afterwards. Logically, there's no place in logic for the time sequence there. So that's the argument that goes on among philosophers and, as I say, leaves the scientists themselves uh, generally uh, completely cold. Uh, and in fact, it's really an argument which, which is, um, you might say, it expresses distrust of the theorist, that the theorist cannot be uh, counted on to be honest. Uh, and you could say, rather than distrust the theorist who explains what has been discovered by experiment, we might just as well distrust the observer who discovers which was what was predicted by the theory. And in fact, some people have made exactly that charge against Eddington, that when Eddington uh, reported the results of his famous eclipse observation in 1919, Eddington already was convinced by the theory and fiddled with the data, left out the, agree the observational points that didn't agree with the theory, uh, and he was in fact uh, influenced by the theoretical prediction in the way that he reported the data, and therefore uh, you can't really say that the data were an independent uh, confirmation. And in fact, Eddington himself made this statement, which is often quoted, uh, one should not put over much confidence in the observational results that are put forward until they have been confirmed by theory. Okay, now this may sound like a sort of a uh, outrageous tongue-in-cheek remark, but it does seem to correspond to his own uh, practice. Uh, so, uh, anyway, it, uh, in 1919, however, uh, it was already known that the uh, advance of Mercury's perihelion could not be explained by the other theories. So in a sense, when general relativity came out and Einstein showed that it did explain the advance of Mer Mercury's per perihelion, it was immediately regarded as support for uh, Einstein's theory, whereas the new phenomenon of the gravitational bending of light, uh, because of the fact that it was, it was new, uh, other theorists had not had their chance. So there were, in fact, other theorists who were still using ether theories in the 1920s who said, well, Einstein has discovered this very interesting phenomenological fact that light is, is, is bent by going close to the sun. That's the Einstein effect. It doesn't mean we have to accept Einstein's explanation of that, but my theory, which doesn't have all these radical consequences about giving up absolute space and time, my theory, this person would say, can also explain it. And if I can explain it by my theory, which makes more sense, doesn't involve such a radical departure from uh, Newtonian physics, then my theory should actually get more credit for this. So this is just sort of the opposite of what Popper uh, would say. And it's only, therefore, after 10 years have gone past, and we're up to 1930, and all these other guys have had their chance, finally, to try to explain light bending and they have failed to do so in a plausible way, then you can say that light bending is really evidence for Einstein's theory, because you now know it's the only uh, game in town. Okay, uh, now what about social construction of scientific knowledge? Um, this is a controversy which has been going on for the last uh, 20 years among people in my field, the so-called science uh, and technology studies, or uh, social uh, sociology of scientific knowledge. Stephen Cole is a sociologist of, you might say, the old school uh, at uh, Stony Brook, who does not agree with the idea of social construction, although he is perfectly happy to talk about social influences on science. That, you know, that the fact that you give resources uh, you give grants for people to do this experiment rather than that experiment is certainly going to have an influence on the growth of a field. So it's not that there are no social factors. The question is, what about the results of the experiments that you do? Uh, is the knowledge, uh, and particularly what goes into the textbook, uh, can that be said to be uh, socially constructed? 
Well, uh, Cole argues that the people who talk about social construction have never proved their case. Uh, and in fact, he makes the statement, there's not a single example in which anybody has used the standard methods of sociology to show that uh, this is the case, that there has been an influence. So he throws this out as a challenge to the social constructionists, and it's published in a couple of different books. Um, David Bloor, who was one of the leaders of, of social constructionism uh, in Edinburgh, uh, finally decides that he can't let this go by, because if nobody replies to it, then they will be admitting that there isn't any case. So he says, OK, here is a single case. Andrew Warwick, who is a historian of science in London, studied in great detail the way in which the theory of relativity was received at Cambridge University in the first few years, let's say between 1905 and 1911, and showed that uh, there are in fact two different interpretations of relativity one of which he refers to as Cambridge mathematics. Uh, the people who went through the mathematics tripos at Cambridge uh, had one version of relativity, and the people who were doing uh, experimental physics had a different view. They, had, they meant different things by what relativity was. In fact, Cunningham uh, actually still maintained the ether theory, didn't see that he had to give up the ether just because Einstein had discarded it. So. Um, Anyway, this is the argument that, that Bloor makes, is that because Warwick has shown that different people meant different things by the theory, therefore, the acceptance of the theory was socially constructed in the sense that it depended on what was the educational background of the person accepting the theory. Was it, did you go through the uh, mathematical education or the experimental physics education, and that would have an effect on how you understood relativity. Well, the problem with that, which I think makes it not really a relevant example, is that 1911 was still very early, and this was before the community of physics as a whole had really accepted uh, relativity, and of course before general relativity was even talked about. Uh, and so it's really still referring to this frontier period, uh, rather than the period in which relativity becomes part of the core of knowledge and is in all of the physics textbooks. So as far as I'm concerned, Bloor has not picked a good example and does not uh, persuade me that this is social construction. Because I think we would all agree that during the frontier period, when a theory is first explained, first, first developed and put forward, that lots of people have different opinions about it, and these different opinions are uh, influenced by their own social circumstances, their own psychology, whatever. The issue is not that. The issue is when the scientific community reaches a consensus on a theory and it gets into the textbook, then we would like to think that all of these biases that make one person differ from another sort of cancel out. And the result that gets into the textbook is pretty much independent of these social influences. And it would be accepted by the entire international scientific community. Uh, the other example which I mentioned is Frank Soloway's book uh, in which he argues that, that the uh, support for revolution uh, in various different fields is uh, correlated with age, with birth order, with social political attitudes, and with religion. And he has a large database uh, to, to demonstrate this. Uh, it is, of course, uh, well known, or at least somewhat believed by a lot of people, that older people are less likely to accept new theories than younger people. And this is, uh, there's a celebrated uh, quotation from Max Planck. Uh, that new theories are more likely to be supported by younger scientists. The reason why the scientific community accepts a new theory is not because the old guys are converted, are persuaded to give up their old ideas. It's just the old guys retire and die out. And uh, the new guys take over the positions in the universities and the journals and so forth. So the community as a whole, the, com the physics community in particular, could be converted from Newtonian mechanics to relativity without any individual physicist actually changing his or her mind, just simply because it's of generational effect. Well, that's a hypothesis which uh, Soloway has tried to test in various cases. Uh, so anyway, what he finds is that in the case of special relativity, he actually divides, he tries to distinguish between uh, 
special and general relativity by time periods. Uh, and uh, in the case of special relativity, it is true that the uh, theory tends to be supported by younger scientists, with the prominent exception of Max Planck, who of course is now in his 60s in uh, 1905, and Max Planck is, is uh, nevertheless uh, one of the uh, prominent supporters, very influential supporters of special relativity. Um, anyway, Soloway finds that the, uh, the theory tends to be uh, supported by the, the uh, uh, liberals. Let's see if I have a see if this thing works. I suppose I should make use of your technology here. Okay, uh, so negative correlation with age. In other words, the younger you are, the more likely you are to support special relativity. Positive correlation with social attitudes of, on the liberal left-wing side. Uh, positive correlation with birth order, mean, meaning that the theory is more likely to support it, be supported by later born uh, especially later born sons in a family, and a slight positive correlation with Jews, slightly more likely to be supported by Jews. These are all for the earlier period before uh, 1919. After 1919, when you're now talking about the general theory, the correlation with birth order is much weaker, although there's still some tendency for younger, more liberal to scientists to uh, support it. And of course, uh, there is now a very vociferous anti-Semitic opposition uh, to relativity because it's perceived, at least in Germany, as being a, uh, a Jewish theory. So anyway, this, this is uh, something which, uh, for some reason, the social constructionists completely ignore this type of thing. But I think if you're going to talk about social uh, effects, then, uh, then you have to be willing to look at social psychological effects, too. OK, now here's a couple of examples of aesthetic mathematical factors in Einstein's own work. Uh, in 1933, he gives a lecture, Nature is the Realization of the Simplest Conceivable Mathematical Ideas. Uh, we can discover by means of purely mathematical constructions uh, the concepts and connections between them that furnish the key to the understanding of natural phenomena. Experience may suggest the appropriate mathematical concepts, but they can't be uh, deduced from it, and so forth. Creative principle resides in mathematics. And in a certain sense, therefore, pure thought can grasp reality as the ancients dreamed. OK, that's what I mean by an aesthetic mathematical factor, which Einstein himself made very explicit, although it doesn't mean that that's why he invented the theory, although there certainly are elements of this even in his first uh, 1905 paper where he talks about the symmetry of the equations uh, and so forth. Uh, but Einstein is basically going about it from the uh, point of view that, you know, if I were God, how would I create the universe in the most beautiful, elegant, simple way uh, possible? Uh, and then this th story by one of his students, uh, I guess I should not give too much attention to because a recent article has uh, thrown doubt on whether this is a legitimate uh, story or not. But uh, it's a nice story, but among <laughs> many. Uh, anyway, and there's Einstein playing the violin, his interest in uh, aesthetics, music, and, and, uh, and so forth. OK. Uh, and Eddington himself, again, uh, relevant to what I said earlier, uh, says this whole business of the theory being accepted because of some little detail, like the bending of light or the advance of the perihelion of Mercury, that's really not important, OK? Uh, these are just minor deviations, but it's not that which, which should attract you. It's the spirit of the new ideas. The, the, uh, uh, it's a theory that leads to an understanding of the world of physics clearer and more penetrating uh, than that previously attained. Uh, Dirac also uh, has a similar statement. Uh, Dirac was very much influenced by uh, Eddington in his in early years. Uh, and even though he was interested in the experimental evidence, uh, he, was, uh, he didn't think that that was really the point, that one sh this is not uh, what really confirms the theory, uh, because he says, suppose there had been a discrepancy. Should you give up the theory? And he said, no. The theory has a character of excellence of its own. A theory with the beauty and elegance of Einstein's theory has to be substantially correct. Okay? And if there's a discrepancy in some application, it's just a secondary theory feature relating to this application and so forth, not a failure of the general principles. Okay, so this is basically what I mean 
by accepting a theory for aesthetic mathematical reasons. It's so beautiful, it must be correct, regardless of what the experiments say. Okay, so that is a, t a reason for accepting uh, relativity. Now, uh, just to go through very quickly uh, a few of the characters here, and this is the result of research by a number of historians who have tracked down the writings of uh, scientists. I think the, the major point I want to make about this, first of all, is that Max Planck was the first really influential advocate of Einstein's theory. Uh, he pointed out that the experiments of Kaufman on the change of mass with velocity uh, did not necessarily refute relativity theory, even though they seemed to do so, that they should really be done over again, and they were, and Einstein was, was, was confirmed later. Planck, as a professor at Berlin, encouraged his students to, to work on this, and Berlin was the center of phys theoretical physics at that time in the early 20th century. He was the editor of the Annalen de Physique, so he was in a position to accept papers that were working out the consequences of relativity, give them special encouragement. And Planck himself said it was the absolute character of the laws of nature, his own basic philosophy about physics, which led him to like uh, Einstein's theory. Other people, uh, again, uh, very influential German physicists at the time, Sommerfeld, Wien, Born, Ehrenfest, and Lowry, found the theory very useful in solving puzzles that they were encountering. For example, the problem of the electron. Is the electron an elementary particle? If so, how can it be deformable? What do you, how do you understand the rigidity of the electron? So very technical problems which, which uh, uh, come up and relativity seems to give a good solution to. Bucherer uh, was one of the people who did experiments. He was initially skeptical of relativity, but his own experiments convinced him uh, that, it was, uh, that it was correct. Another group of people uh, in Germany, uh, partly overlapping, uh, liked the theory because it, it somehow catered to their idea of the harmony of the world. Uh, mentioned Cunningham already. Uh, there are people who are using the, uh, in Britain also using relativity to calculate the interactions between uh, electrons. Um, we mentioned already uh, Eddington and Dirac, who, who made very clear their, their uh, aesthetic and mathematical reasons. Uh, in France, uh, France was the country that was, of the major scientific countries, the slowest to adopt relativity. Uh, and uh, Paul Langevin was the only prominent French physicist until the 1950s who actually came out in favor of relativity, and apparently the reason was that he had been arriving at some of the same conclusions as Einstein with his own work on electromagnetic theory, and he liked the idea of unifying all these theories. Uh, now, in Russia, we have uh, people like Lebedev who were interested in things like light pressure and electromagnetic theory, but we also have in Russia a strong mathematical tradition, of course, going back to uh, Lobachevsky in non-Euclidean geometry. So when it turns out that Einstein's general theory is going to be uh, relying very heavily on non-Euclidean geometry, mathematicians get very interested in this. And uh, furthermore, in uh, Russia, the prestige of German physics is important. So, what we have happening here in this first phase is that a few very well-known, very highly respected German physicists jump on the bandwagon and start the bandwagon rolling, use relativity, at, talk it up, advocate it, and write papers on it, and then the reputation of these early advocates then tends to impress people in other countries who say, well, this is obviously the hottest thing going in, in physics, so uh, better jump on the bandwagon too. Uh, but they all have somewhat different reasons for, uh, for doing so. Um, I think the, 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 um, the reason for the mathematicians uh, uh, being interested in it is, I think, in not just in, in Russia, but in other countries like, like uh, Spain and Italy, is that it enhances their social prestige. Now, this is, you might say, an example from the category of social construction. In other words, if you are a mathematician, uh, you don't have a big reputation in the country at large. You don't maybe get very much respect from the rest of the scientific community. Suddenly, out comes this theory of general relativity. You, the mathematician, are the local expert on 
non-Euclidean geometry, tensor analysis, differential geometry, whatever is needed, the physicists have to start coming to you to explain Einstein's theory. This immediately enhances your prestige, makes you feel important. Okay, so that's according to what some historians have found, is a reason why mathematicians who previously maybe had no interest whatsoever in physics uh, suddenly become very enthusiastic supporters of uh, relativity theory because it enhances their own uh, social prestige. Okay, now there's a book uh, edited by uh, historian uh, Thomas Glick that was, is called The Comparative Reception of Relativity and he got a number of authors together to write chapters of, for this book in which they would each look at the country that they were most familiar with and to identify the people who were the advocates and the opponents of relativity. Uh, and so if you put these all together, you have a population of almost uh, 200 uh, people, mainly physicists, uh, who were in the major uh, European countries uh, plus Japan. And Basically, they're showing that, that uh, you know, if you just count the numbers, you have 137 people in favor and 54 people against uh, relativity. This is just the sort of the most primitive type of head counting, who is accepted relativity, who is not. What I'm interested in is the numbers in brackets here, uh, which unfortunately most of these historians have not investigated in enough detail people who were converted, people who were previously opposed, actually on the public record as opposed to relativity, and at some point later then became in favor of relativity. Only seven people have been identified this way. That's what I would like to know. Why did they change their minds? Because I think that would be a very interesting thing to know. Why does somebody initially opposed to the theory uh, actually uh, change and, and uh, become a, uh, a supporter? Okay, so what I have done is I have taken this, uh, this book as the primary source because it puts all this data together and in a sense written according to similar standards uh, to see what were the most frequently mentioned factors that were used by historians to explain why relativity was accepted. Simply by counting those, you know, was the, the, taking the cases where they actually could say this particular scientist accepted the theory and mentioned this particular reason for doing so, or at least the historian decided that was the reason. So this shows, according to this, this uh, survey then, that, that uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment was the most frequently mentioned empirical factor. And as I suggested before, once you accept relativity, say special theory of relativity on the basis of the Michelson-Morley experiment, presumably this makes you at least somewhat receptive to the general theory. And so uh, unfortunately, this, most of the data is not fine-grained enough to distinguish between whether somebody only accepted the special theory or also the special, the general theory. Uh, but I think it, it did have some, some influence in, in getting people interested in the theory. The second most frequently mentioned was, of course, the uh, observations of light bending. So I think the, 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 the point is that the light bending observation did make an impression uh, and uh, was one of the things that was a big sensation, which brought the theory to the attention of the scientific community as well as the world as a whole. You remember that this uh, observation was done in 1919, just after the world, end of World War I, very bitter war between the British and the Germans. Uh, and here we have uh, a British team going out and confirming a German theory, which is very impressive and suggests that you know, science is going to bring the warring nations together. Science is international, uh, and we can all get together even if we fight each other on every other issue. So I think it was made a big impression. It made Einstein, for several decades, the most well-known physicist in the world, or most well-known scientist, in fact, uh, as uh, I guess it was uh, Time magazine which uh, confirmed this, this uh, man of the, of the century. Uh, so anyway, this was, this was a tremendously sensational thing and, and uh, did seem to have a big influence on persuading the physics community to accept the whole package of relativity. Um, 
Now, these others are rather odd, and I have to say, don't take them too seriously because they're based on extremely small samples. Uh, that is to say, there are the, the, the uh, things that you could identify as social factors uh, were very few, and in most countries, uh, the historian who, wrote, who did this work didn't seem to be systematically looking for uh, social or psychological factors. So we have this rather mysterious reason, uh, which comes mainly out of Spain and Glick's own research. Uh, the rejection of absolute space and time is consistent with neo-scholastic theology. Uh, now, I haven't been able to get anybody to explain this to me. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, I have recently done a little bit of reading for my course on, on uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was uh, the person who became famous for reconciling Aristotelian philosophy with uh, Christian theology, uh, in particular, the apparent discrepancy between these two ideas uh, was that in Aristotelian philosophy, the world is eternal, uh, whereas uh, it has no creation. It's always existed from, from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, whereas in Christian theology, God created the world at a certain time. And so um, this reconciliation was done by Aquinas saying, uh, in effect, that, that uh, when God created the world, he created time at the same time, so that there was no time before the creation of the world, and therefore uh, the world can be eternal in the sense that there was nothing which existed out of time, but uh, nevertheless the world was created. I don't know that that has anything to do with it. I just throw this in because I'm puzzled by this. The other thing is the respect for the authority of German physics, which again is a social factor. Uh, if you want to be advanced in your academic career in your own country, uh, it's a good thing to be uh, on the side of the big guys. Uh, in this case, the Germans are the ones who control the major positions and have the greatest uh, respect uh, in this period of the 1910s, 1920s. Um, Mathematical aspects of the theory, as I mentioned already, are, seem to be especially important in Italy and Russia, where mathematicians are very prominent, very have a big role in the academic uh, intellectual world of the country, uh, even more than, than physicists, perhaps. Uh, and uh, they are therefore attracted by the mathematical uh, aspects. But I think, in general, even outside of mathematics, the idea of the elegance, the unification of the theory uh, uh, appeals to a number of people. Um, so uh, I think we mentioned all of these, these other things before. So let me just uh, go through then the, uh, what I think uh, happened in a narrative way. Um, Let's, let's say there's basically three stages. This is why I wanted to be sure that if you can't read this very well, you should come down closer. Uh, OK. Uh, anyway, there's a three-stage answer, which I wanted to have all at one, on one sheet. Uh, first of all, we have a few leading scientists, Planck and Eddington in particular, adopt the theory because it satisfied their desire for a coherent, mathematically sophisticated, fundamental picture of the universe. OK, basically aesthetic reasons. Uh, in the second stage, their enthusiastic advocacy persuaded other scientists to work on the theory and apply it to the problems that were currently of great interest, the behavior of electrons and Bohr's atomic model. You remember Sommerfeld's work on the Bohr model uh, was uh, important in showing uh, the role of relativistic uh, effects on the orbit uh, in, of the electron. Uh, so this, by 1910, uh, you have the theory accepted by many important German physicists and beginning to attract attention in other countries. Then in the third stage, you have the confirmation of Einstein's light bending prediction. Uh, now, the light bending prediction is uh, important in publicizing the theory, putting it on the agenda, making people aware of it. but. Apparently, the fact that the light bending was a novel prediction did not play a particularly important role. And this is one of the things that I looked at in, in, uh, in detail. Physicists generally in this period or for the next two or three decades talked about the three predictions of general relativity theory, advance of the perihelion of Mercury, 
gravitational bending of light and the gravitational redshift. They lump them all together as predictions, despite the fact that the advance of the perihelion of Mercury was already known. Okay? It is almost impossible to find any case where the uh, novelty played a role. In other words, where the fact that the gravitational bending of light was a prediction of something not yet known gave it greater credit, greater weight toward accepting the theory than the advance of the perihelion of Mercury, which was already known. So in this particular case, I think you have a very good control which shows that physicists do not, in their public statements, give credit to novelty, to being a novel prediction, as compared with an explanation of something already known. The value of a novel prediction is therefore surprise and publicity, that you get publicity by making a novel prediction, but once the scientists are willing to look into the theory and say, okay, now does it really follow from this, that such and such else, then the, prediction, the fact that it's a novel prediction doesn't really count for much because this, the, the, the theoretical physicists, at least, are not going to be fooled by this. They're going to be able to see whether does it, in fact, follow from general relativity this effect of the advance of the perihelion of Mercury. The fact that it was or was not a novel prediction doesn't really uh, make any difference. Uh, so we have uh, relativity appealing to, to people for a number of different reasons. Uh, and uh, mathematicians uh, were, were uh, willing to accept it for reasons you might consider to be self-serving, or at least it corresponded to their interest in what they could, uh, how they could advance their own careers by being experts on, on non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, astronomers, I didn't talk about this, but, but uh, I've gone into this in more detail in the, in the paper. Uh, in the United States, some of the later tests of the gravitational light, light bending were made by American astronomers who did not initially have any particular commitment to the theory. They were simply, this is simply a, you know, a, an, ex, an ex observation that needed to be done more accurately than Eddington's group had done it. The Americans provided evidence for Einstein's theory and then they were attacked by other people. And so they had to defend themselves, and in defending their own observations, they more or less put themselves in the position of defenders of relativity. So this is why uh, some of the American astronomers who initially were not particularly interested in the theory became defenders of relativity simply because they had to defend their own research and the prestige of their own institutions, which had given this support to, uh, to relativity. Okay. Um, I think that the, the, uh, on the last paragraph here, uh, one, reason, one result of the confirmations of the general theory was to persuade many more physicists to use the special theory in their research and teaching. Uh, they accepted the general theory in a rather vague sense, but they didn't actually use it or even understand it very much. Uh, but special relativity did become an integral part of physics uh, and uh, was used in, in uh, physics courses on the college level uh, within a few decades. So I guess I will stop there and welcome any questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> The number of people who had what? Oh, had not. Well, this was, this was, again, the time period is a little vague on this as to what time period this refers to. In other words, I, I think we're talking mainly about the period up to 1930. And remember also the fact that in France, there were the, the, the French physicists in general, with a few prominent exceptions, did not accept relativity until much later. So, so there's still, by 1930, I think it's, it's a majority have accepted it, but by no means unanimous. Uh, I don't think that there are any well-known individuals who reject special relativity. Uh, 
There are some people, including one fairly well-known person at the University of Maryland, who rejects the general theory of relativity and is pushing an alternative. So that, I think, is still somewhat controversial. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting well, question, okay. which is uh, still being. You want to repeat the question? You, do you want to have this? He, he he was given the Nobel Prize for photoelectron effects. Yeah. Okay. The question. The, I mean, the the point is, why did Nobel get? Why did Einstein get the Nobel Prize? And officially, he got it for the photoelectric effect, which was basically uh, a version of quantum theory. Uh, rather than relativity. Now, the one reason, which is perhaps fairly simple, is that at that time it was considered the Nobel Prize should be given uh, for, for discoveries. And the word discovery was usually interpreted to mean an experimental discovery. And since the photoelectric effect led directly, or could be tested directly, or was talking about what would happen in a very specific experiment, uh, which had been done by that time by, by Millikan. Uh, therefore, I suppose you could argue that there shouldn't be any controversy about the uh, importance of that theory, uh, whereas the relativity theory as of 1920, when this was happening, was still somewhat controversial. Uh, and also, it was not clear that there was a specific experiment that Einstein could be thought responsible for. Uh, but I, I think it does have to do with the internal politics of the committee that is awarding the Nobel Prizes. And this is a subject that's just now being investigated by historians because they've opened up the archives to research. That was that same group of fairly influential German phys physicists who were uh, responsible for everything else, wasn't it? Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, you might say, well, since Planck was a very influential German physicist, uh, he would have been pushing Einstein on the basis of, of relativity, too. Yes. It's, do you have any clue about why Einstein was working on relativity? OK. Uh, I think that he was self-educated to a large extent. Uh, he tells us himself in his autobiographical notes that you know, at the age of 16, he had this fantasy about if I am traveling through space uh, next to a beam of light, uh, would the beam of light look like a stationary electromagnetic wave rather than a moving one? And then somehow that didn't work. And he was sort of intrigued by the whole idea of what would happen if you went at the speed of light. So he tells us himself that was one of the reasons he first got interested in the theory. Now, at that time, he was still thinking in terms of ether theories. And there is actually an early Einstein manuscript that was never published until recently uh, on an ether theory. I think the other thing is that he, as part of his own self-education in physics, uh, read about Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Uh, there was a, uh, a German textbook by Furpel, uh, which, uh, according to Gerald Holton, raised the issue of the symmetry effects, the symmetry between electric and magnetic fields, depending on the frame of reference, in words that are very similar to those that are found in Einstein's first paper. So it could be, I mean, it's not proved that he read that book, but at least this was something he might have read. It was a German physics textbook uh, in which the issue of the symmetry, symmetrical decision, dis description of electric and magnetic fields was raised. So possibly he could have gotten it from that or from some thinking about the nature of, of uh, the Maxwell equations. Yep. Well, what, what theories? that are being advocated today, you see this paradigm being played out. <laughs> being played <laughs> out? Well, in certain, which sense? The people are very dubious of a certain theory being advocated, and it's very, very levels of acceptance. Oh, OK. Uh, well, first of all, the, I guess the one thing that I think of immediately is string theory, because you have, on the one hand, uh, a number of mathematically inclined physicists very enthusiastic about string theory, uh, 
because it's going to do this and that to unify you know, theory of everything, even if it takes 11 dimensions to do it. Other people, very respectable theoretical physicists, like I guess Glashow is an example, saying, uh, where's your experiment? How can, we, how can we possibly take seriously a theory that doesn't look like it has ever been or could ever be tested by any experiment? So you see the argument being played out in the sense of, well, what's the criterion by which you operate? Is it an empirical criterion that any acceptable theory has to be testable uh, as soon as possible before anybody else will take it seriously? Or is it this aesthetic mathematical thing, which we saw with, with Eddington and Dirac and Einstein himself, saying the theory is so beautiful it has to be correct, I don't care what your experiment says. So I think that would be an example of the same conflict between different criteria for accepting theories. Uh, this goes to your Spanish observation. Yes. And you omit all statements of fundamental propositions uh, discussed by Haas of Harvard. And the notion is that you, you must begin all conceptions of science with certain fundamental propositions. Once you have chosen these fundamental propositions, then the mathematics or the logic or the beauty of it can, consistent with mm -hmm. these foundational premises, can be confirmed. Mm -hmm. So that, in effect, one has to begin a discussion of the validity of science mm -hmm. by beginning with foundational statements. Who uh, says, who says this? At, at Haas Harvard. Ha Maybe there's something you can... Okay, Haas is, Arthur Haas is a f physicist who has written books about science, about physics. Is this the person you're no, talking no, about? No, 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 it's a what? It's a lady. A woman. Okay. Okay, okay, well, anyway, is this a question or, or a statement? Yeah, it was a, que it was a question about whether one needs fundamental propositions first. Oh, I see. Okay, I would say no, because I think in some of the most famous revolutions, Copernican theory and um, quantum theory, um, the fundamental pr proposition or the change to a new fundamental pr proposition only came later. That is, that the Copernican system was worked out uh, as a heliocentric th theory, but it was accepted initially a basic because it gave you a better way of calculating the positions of the planets. Only later, after Galileo, was the fundamental proposition of the Earth going around the sun rather than the other way around, was that accepted. In the case of quantum theory, Planck introduced quantum, the, the quantum hypothesis in 1900 as a mathematical device for calculating a radiation distribution law without in any way intending at that time to say radiation is quantized in a physical sense. It was a purely mathematical device. Only five or 10 years later did the implications of that come, become clear and people then said, now we've got a new fundamental proposition. So therefore, I would disagree with your source. Well. You mentioned several times that uh, physicists are often left rather cold by the, uh, the arguments and discussions of the philosophers. Right. Uh, do you get the impression that that may be that because the philosophers don't understand the power of the quantitative agreement mm -hmm. of the predictions of physical theory? In other words, it isn't that general relativity predicted the precession of Mercury, the aperiod mm -hmm. of Mercury. It predicted, within experimental error, the right one, right. and it right. was a theory that had no fudge factors in it. Right. And the same thing is true about the increase of, of mass with, with, with velocity. Right. Namely, with only one constant, which is measurable, the speed of light, it predicted mm -hmm. the correct functional form mm -hmm. for the increase of mass. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, in my very dilatory reading of the philosophers, and I confess I've never finished a book. Yeah. I've tried to start it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. I get the feeling they don't grasp how hard it is to hit the target, how hard mm -hmm. it is to get a quantitative agreement right. Right. out of a theory that doesn't have a fudge factor in it. Right. Right. I mean, in other words, the increase of, 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 the, uh, of the relativistic mass comes from the basic uh, uh, tenets of special relativity plus conservation of momentum. Right. It's not a circular right. argument. Okay, I would agree with that to the extent that some philosophers of science, 
nowadays talk a lot about what they call the underdetermination thesis, which states that with any given set of experimental facts, uh, you can have many different theories to explain those. So that the theory is sort of underdetermined by the facts. It's, and they, they're basically, this sometimes goes by the name of the Duhem Quine thesis or something like that. Uh, and they're saying that there is no unique logical deduction from a set of facts to a particular theory, that you can always find some other theory that would explain the facts just as well. And I would say the fundamental fallacy of that thesis is what you just said, that oftentimes if you're going to apply rigorous quantitative criteria, there may be no theory which will explain the facts in a satisfactory way, and therefore as soon as somebody finds one theory, there's a big tendency to jump on that and say, that's the answer. Okay, now logically speaking, there may be some other theory which would also explain it, and sometimes that does in fact happen. Somebody comes up with an, a better theory later on. But I think that would be one, I would agree with you on that case. I think the, the thing, the reason I find it useful to read philosophy of science uh, is not that I believe what they say about how science is done, but that they have some interesting hypotheses which they argue about among themselves about how scientists might work, and this thing about novel prediction is one example. So I see the, the philosophers as basically serving the role of theorists to the historians who serve the role of the observers and experimentalists, because historians tend to ignore theory, but to be not interested in theory, they're just interested in you know, just the facts, one after another. And if you're going to ask interesting questions about the history of science, such as what I'm talking about, why do theories get accepted, then you, it is the philosophers who have provided you with several different possible answers which you can then go out and test on your historical material. So that's what I use philosophy for. So you, you finished the quotes. <laughs> <laughs> well, more, more than one. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay.